There's too many of you crying. Mm, brother, brother, brother. Far too many of you dying. But we've got to find a way. To bring some love in, some love in here today. Pick your lines and pick your signs. Don't punish me with brutality. Come on, talk to me. Talk to me. So that you can see oh, what's going on. What's going Tell on? Tell me what's going on. What's going oh, on? For spacious yes. skies, uh -huh. for amber uh -huh. waves uh -huh. of grain. Mm -hmm. What's going hey. on? For purple mountains, What's going on? Above the fruited plain, America, oh. America, oh. God shed His grace on thee. What's going on? Shining sea. Hi everyone, welcome to New Swan Shakespeare Center. What you just saw was the trailer and the opening moments of director Kenny Leone's production of Much Ado About Nothing for the Public Theater's Shakespeare in the Park in 2019. Like many people, I saw the show not live in New York, but broadcast by PBS over Thanksgiving weekend some months later. Kenny Leone is an Atlanta-based theater director, and as you can see from the banners hanging across the set, the play is set during Stacey Abrams' campaign. Since 2019, we have been living through a pandemic, and we've survived an election in which Stacey Abrams, Atlanta, and the state of Georgia played a very major role. We've also witnessed and participated in the most powerful worldwide expression of solidarity with Black lives since the civil rights movement in a series of events whose impact continues to unfold each week and day. My friend, collaborator, and former student Jabril Jackson and I came up with the idea for tonight's conversation a while ago before and during the events that continue to shape and reshape the subject before us, Shakespeare and Black life. Today's event is our Kirk Davis Jr. Annual Public Shakespeare Lecture, which is made possible by our generous community friend, Mr. Kirk Davis. Thank you, Kirk, for caring about Shakespeare and for selecting tonight's event as your signature lecture this year. Tonight, we're going to be hearing from actor Jeremy Harris. Jeremy played Claudio in the 2019 Much Ado About Nothing. He also played Tonomy Wallace in FX's Legion and Langston Hughes in the 2015 film Bessie. You might recognize him as Leon Biddle in season four of Fargo. Jeremy studied acting at New York University and the Juilliard School. Jeremy will be interviewed by Jabril Jackson. Jabril received his MFA in dance from UCI in 2020, and he's now a PhD student in theater and performance studies at Columbia. He writes, choreographs, and directs story ballets for film, inspired in part by the plays of Shakespeare. You can post your questions in the Q&A chat and I am super happy to welcome everyone here today and also to hand over the conversation now to Jabril and Jeremy. Thank you guys for being here. Welcome to UCI. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Julia. It's so great to be back. Um, it's great to see you and the familiar faces here and especially this familiar face. Jeremy, welcome to Thank UCI. You. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, yeah, it's been a minute since we've been here together uh, touring with Samora, so it's great to be here in the same space again, um, even if it's virtual. 
But uh, I wanted to make sure that I got to speak with you after seeing this incredible production. Um, you were amazing in it, and I'm such a big fan of your work. And I wanted to, you know, kind of give everyone the opportunity to get to know you as a person, as an artist, um, as well as through this production. So um, I wanted to start off by asking you, like, what was your journey like into acting? How did it all start? Um, well, I think it's my journey into art in general, I think, came through poetry. Um, and when I was younger, I would always write poetry. And I just guess I got intrigued by, by the ideas that by the idea of words mm -hmm. and you know, bodies interpreting those words, and then complete idea of storytelling. So when I was going, I did this program at the uh, Harlem School of the Arts. I think it was the summer after my senior year in high school. Um, and I just met a lot of great artists there, young artists like myself at the time. And I met some actors there who had studied. Um, I met Wendell Pierce, um, who's an actor from The Wire and a bunch of other mm -hmm. great um, shows. And he went to Juilliard. So I just like had some conversations with him um, because the classical theater of Harlem at the time was housed at the Harlem School of Arts. So I would see all of these actors come in and uh, do productions there. I would just like pick their brain about their process and how they, you know, trained and got into acting. Um, and, you know, I did, I, after talking to them, different artists, I decided that I, you know, it was something I wanted to do in addition to taking some classes at NYU. Because when I was actually uh, in NYU, I wasn't focused on acting originally. Mm -hmm. um, so it was something I just started to, to learn a little more about and just to, you know, drop myself into the deep end to try to learn as much as I could. Man, that's that's really fascinating, especially with um, everyone's kind of obsession and memory of poetry around Shakespeare. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's great that that is your entryway and it, it would explain so much um, your incredible elocution of the text. Uh, but um, even more specifically, um, I'm, I'm curious too about your curiosity. You always struck me as a very curious person. I remember you always asking questions when we were at school and through the process of the, the different work that we've done together. Um, and, and so I'm curious about what your experience was like transitioning. Like, what did you do starting out at NYU? And how did you transition into acting from there and then going on to the Juilliard School? Like, how was that process and how did that unfold for you? Yeah, so I think like maybe my senior year in high school, I was just trying to figure out what I would be interested in, even though I had written poetry like sporadically throughout high school. Um, and then there was this program at the Harlem School of the Arts that was like a summer theater program. So I was like, okay, let me try that out. Maybe this is, and I think it had like poetry included. You took classes in poetry and you could possibly write and create your own pieces of theater. Mm -hmm. So I was like, this may be something that would be of interest to me. So I auditioned for that. I ended up getting in um, and I had a great time there. And I played, and that was the first time I was ever in a Shakespeare play because we did the Scottish play, ah. which is what you say when you're in a theater, but it's Macbeth. Mm -hmm. um, and I played murderer number one there in that play. Mm -hmm. And that was through the classical theater of Harlem because they had a summer outdoor theater uh, production similar to like Shakespeare in the Park at different, but it was just, this was um, in Harlem. Mm -hmm. So I did that and, you know, I was just intrigued by it, but I was still headed to NYU to, I think I was studying business at the time. Mm -hmm. I was still headed there to study that, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, my interest was peaked. Mm -hmm. So then I think the thing that helped make the change was there was this director her name is Dee Reese. She was at the, that time, she was in the MFA grad film program. And now she's going on to be Oscar nominated for a film Mudbound that she did. And she had another film, Pariah, that mm -hmm. people consider her breakout. I think that was her first feature film. I was also in that for uh, like a short, I had a smaller role in Pariah mm -hmm. as well. And she's also who I did Bessie with when I played Langston Hughes, I did Bessie with her. Wow. But um, she, she had a short film and I auditioned for that and I did that. And that film got into the Tribeca Film Festival. Mm -hmm. So I got to see myself, you know, with films, you do them. I might have done that like my freshman year, but it didn't come out until maybe my sophomore year. Right, right. Right. Because um, post-production, editing, entering mm -hmm. festivals, getting accepted, 
yeah. all those things, you know, film takes a long time. So I got to see myself up on a big screen uh, in a festival and people were just had nice things to say. And I think it just helped build my confidence that acting could be possibly something that, you know, I could do or actually pursue mm -hmm. as a career path. So after that happened, um, I just, you know, the idea was, was sparked within me. Mm -hmm. So then I reached back out to some of the people at the Classical Theater of Harlem. And then I would, I just asked them, could I, you know, is there anything around the theater that I could do? So I ended up, what was I doing? I, I ended up like taking money and giving people tickets. And I ended up like helping clean the theater. And that's where I actually met um, Wendell Pierce and an actor named J. Kyle Manze. He went to NYU grad acting program. Mm -hmm. And there were uh, Billy Eugene Jones, who was actually in our production of Much Ado About Nothing, was mm -hmm. in their production of Waiting for Godot. So I actually met him a long time ago. And I was just, you know, handing out um, uh, programs and cleaning up the theater and doing those things. And so that being around those people and having those conversations was what really allowed me to believe that maybe I could go to Juilliard. Maybe I can get into the, one of these like really difficult programs that accept like 16 or 18 people per year. Maybe I had the ability to do it. Mm -hmm. And Wendell was really great. He brought me on the set of, he was doing a movie called Life Support, an HBO movie at the time with Queen Latifah. Mm -hmm. He actually brought me on set of, of that movie when they were filming. Mm -hmm. And he was just really great. He always answered any questions I had. And then I think through meeting him and talking to different people who were actors at NYU mm -hmm. and D. Reese, you know, it just helped build my confidence that I could possibly do this. And I, you know, I told myself if I do it, I want to, you know, get some training. Right. So I thought Juilliard would be a great place, mainly because of Wendell. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is just the person who I know who is open to answering my questions. I was like, okay, this is a great program. I've heard so much about it. And I applied and I got in. And that, that was the start of me getting into Juilliard. And then at Juilliard was just a really immersive program where you're you know, training your voice and your body and you're reading a bunch of um, plays and you're always working on plays and you're in class with a bunch of like-minded people and you're in class with, in school with people like yourself with dancers and musicians. It's just like a place, you know, it's like a, a a breeding ground, literally is a breeding ground for performing artists. And you're just meeting people and collaborating with people. Mm -hmm. And I think your just imagination and the possibilities just continue to grow. And that, I guess, was the, the, the start of my professional artistic life started there. Wow, that's, that is an incredible journey. And it's not common that people reach out and are just looking for any kind of work within the theater. That's how you know when someone is really hungry for the work, you know, someone who is like, let me clean up the theater, let me pass out programs. <laughs> and, but you know, that I, I find that that is a kind of humility that follows you, which I think is, is exceptional and an incredible example for people to look up to and see like, oh, wow, like I don't have to just go straight and go straight from not being an actor to trying to be the star actor uh, on a play. I can work in and around the theater and learn how the whole thing works. And then through there, being able to appreciate all those various layers. Yeah, um, and I think you kind of realize that the theater is a small community after you, you know, you do things like that. You realize that, because it is, it's, it's, it's a tough thing to pursue. You know, you're not always paid the most. And it, it's a lot of it is just passion. Right. So I think when people see someone who's hungry or someone who wants to learn, they're very open to help because they, you know, understand how much passion it takes to work mm -hmm. in this particular industry. Well, that leads us to our next question um, regarding the industry. Once you did your training, NYU, Juilliard, what was it like? How has it been navigating film, television, and theater? And now kind of focusing in on the topic of this discussion, how have questions of race been involved or absent in either? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, graduating school, um, everyone's process is different. I think that's the, the thing that is interesting about going to a conservatory program and then leaving. When you're in a conservatory program, you start to, you know, everyone for lack 
most of the time is on the same level. You're all in classes together. You're studying the same things. You're rotating in roles. If maybe if you had a lead role in last production, you might have a smaller role in this production. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, you're, you're in scene study class together. You're, you're taking pointers from your teachers and like your other classmates are throwing things um, out, you know, to give you just their, their opinions about your work. Mm -hmm. And then you leave the program and it's almost like you have everyone, you're still connected, but everyone goes their separate way. So someone may come out and do a big play right away. Someone may go out, come out and do a big TV show or a film right away. Mm -hmm. And then you start to realize in school, I think a big transition was that you may play someone because we're, we were all pretty much, you know, in our 20s and some people were in their early 30s. Mm -hmm. If you had a character who was 70 years old, you might have a 20 year old playing a 70 year old, right? Mm -hmm. Or you might have some even playing like a 50 year old. And then you leave and you realize that you have a type and you realize that your race matters or the way you look matters or um, your body type matters or mm -hmm. uh, how much facial hair you have matters. All the, all the things that I, that I think in some ways in school um, are overlooked to focus solely on the art mm -hmm. of acting and the craft of acting, mm -hmm. you start to realize that there's other aspects of it that come into, into place. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're in a, in a much better time now in the acting industry or the entertainment industry than some of our forefathers have been in, mm -hmm. but there's still obviously a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. um, and race is always something that, it's a visual medium. Yeah. So for, for better or worse, race will always be a part of yeah. the conversation, mm -hmm. um, as will like eye color and, and all the other physical traits you have. Mm -hmm. So it's something that you, you think about, um, Sometimes there are things that they'll say like, this is open casting for everyone, mm -hmm. you know? So they may allow everyone to, to audition for a particular project. Mm -hmm. Does it mean that they'll go what they call non-traditional casting? Not necessarily. Sometimes they'll say a role, this is like a specifically non-traditional role. I think that's what they'll call it, where they're mm -hmm. looking for someone who, a person of color to play a particular role. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you audition for things and you, Fig what what sticks for you sticks for you what what doesn't you have to learn to just you know do it and move on there's like a saying do it and forget about it so you audition and the moment it's, it's done you let it go and if it comes back to you then it's meant for you and that's kind of the process of what it is and you learn to, to build your own um artistic community people who can help you do self-tapes people who can uh um you know if you need a coaching someone who can refer you to another coach, I have classmates who've been like, oh, I really liked working with this particular person. You may check them out. And then you, then as you go along, you start to shape your career and figure out what you want to do. Like, do I want to do a play right now? Would I really want to be a part of this TV show or this film? If you have that, you know, if you have the ability to do that, um, depending on your finances and what you, how long you've, you've the, since the last time you've worked or not. Right. That's part of how it, um, you know, the business goes. That, if that makes sense, I know it's, no, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense, and and so I, and I was curious too, even about like the difference between. So you were saying that they kind of didn't really highlight the racial aspects in school as, as much as in the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I, I remember one time. So in my final year at Juilliard, we campaigned to do one of the main stage productions, or what they what they're called. We wanted to have it at least one of the plays be by a black playwright. Mm -hmm. And that was something that was important to myself and my other black classmates because we hadn't really been given the opportunity to play black people um, in a lot of plays, like outside of scene study. Scene study is things that you would bring in. I may say like, if you're in my class with me, mm -hmm. it may be like, Jabril, like, do you wanna do a, a, a scene from, I don't know, I'm just, of course, I'm thinking of August Wilson Fences, right? If you want to do a scene from Fences, then we could do that and we bring it in and break it down or from 
Stephen Adley Gurges or whoever it is from a player mm-hmm. where, you know, you're actually playing, you know, someone of your race. But a lot of the times you are, you know, it's a lot of colorblind casting um, to make sure that, you know, everyone can play different roles. So I may play um, a, a role in a Tennessee Williams play that I wouldn't necessarily get the opportunity to play for mm-hmm. the most part, like out in the professional world. Mm-hmm. But we wanted to um, make sure that we had that opportunity to do that. So um, we did a play by Nathan Jackson and we did a play by Athel Fugard. Athel is a white dude, a white guy, white, white South African okay. uh, man. But I got to play a South African a black South African and um, one of my other classmates, he got to play a black South African as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and in Nathan's play, we got to, um, you know, it was a bunch of us and we played, mm-hmm. you know, black characters, the, the four of us in the show got to do that. So it's something that I think we had to bring attention to the faculty and, and let them know this is something that we wanted to do and that, you know, was overlooked. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think as you start, reach you know you you may start in there like a fresh bud just wanting to do everything and then as you get closer to leaving you start to realize like well when I get out of here you know I may not be in I don't know Tennessee Williams anymore Mm -hmm. that's not going to be the majority of stuff that I'm auditioning for and you start to realize like you're going to have to advocate for yourself and I think you the sooner you can realize that the you know because you're gonna have to do that in your career as well you're gonna have to advocate for yourself yeah. And so and so with that, um, I just have one more question in relation to this, and it'll kind of segue us into speaking specifically about Shakespeare. Um, what are some things that were Im- specifically important about playing a character that was a Black character um, in, in relation to all of the things that you have to do, as opposed to colorblind casting, for example, um, mm-hmm. where you're playing a character that you wouldn't, wouldn't usually get a chance to play and how does that form or align with or go against like your relationship to Shakespeare? Mm-hmm. I think it was important for me to play a black character to know that your experience is valid and important. And it's like a story that's worthy of being told. Mm. I think that's the importance of representation in general, whether it's in theater or film or television. Mm-hmm. is that these stories matter for people who are watching them and they matter for the people who are performing them. Because mm-hmm. our existence is validated, whether it's, <laughs> whether it's not shown on TV, whether it is shown on TV, right. whether we're shown only in one particular light, you can't use these things, you can't use any external thing to validate your existence. It has to come from within and knowing that because you are alive and that you are human and that you are who you are, you are worthy of every other opportunity Mm -hmm. and privilege that everyone else has, right? Mm -hmm. So I think like once you start having that that idea and knowing that, you start to question why isn't X, Y, and Z happening? Why haven't I played a Black character? If my existence is as important as everyone else's, why isn't my experience or the experience of people who look like me, their cultural experience, why aren't these stories being told? And I think right. that's an important thing to challenge the world as an artist. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's why it was, was important to me. And it's, you know, I think that's why the connection feels deep is because you're, you're speaking about um, a shared history. Mm-hmm. And I remember like, And I'll get to about my relationship to Shakespeare. I remember our first year at Juilliard, we had something called an ancestor project. Mm -hmm. And you could do an ancestor who you're actually related to, to, um, who's from your lineage, or you can claim an ancestor. Mm -hmm. So I claimed an ancestor, Mm -hmm. right? So even though, and I did uh, something on Fred Hampton. So even though I wasn't related to him, the fact that he existed, the fact that his story was so important and lesser known. Thankfully, it's a little bit more known because of Judas and the Black Messiah, which just came out and it's, you know, getting a lot of awards and and Mm -hmm. buzz. Mm -hmm. But that was important because he inspired me. 
and me playing that character, it helps me to, you know, it helps me to clear my spirit or to, to and it validates, um, you know, it helps to continue to validate that these stories are important and it opens this up to the audience as well. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to Shakespeare, there obviously aren't that many characters, prominent ca- ca- characters of color mm-hmm. within its plays, which it, you know, is a sign of the times, right? I think that hopefully a hundred years from now, there'll be much more diversity in film, television, and plays, and much more just representation of what the world actually is, not just diversity, but a true representation and reflection of all the people who actually exist on this earth. Right. So hopefully a hundred years from now, that's gonna be more consistent than it is now. Mm-hmm. So with that being said, I think that I was drawn to, I think more than anything, I was drawn to Shakespeare's tragedies, King Lear, mm-hmm. Macbeth, Othello, things that focus on human emotions that we can all understand and have that, um, or that maybe people around us had that we can really relate to. Mm-hmm. It was those old stories, even though they weren't necessarily written with people of color in mind, mm-hmm. you know, aside from maybe Othello, it's, mm-hmm. it's those ideas that were just grand and large that, that, made, that made me, you know, connect to it. Like um, in King Lear, when you have two brothers, one brother who feels like he should be the heir to the throne, but because he was born, I forget the exact line, but Mm -hmm. like 10 or something moonshines lack of a brother so he said something like that because I was born some mere like 10 months or whatever it is after this person now that automatically invalidates me like Mm -hmm. that idea you know can speak to you or when or the the, uh, King Lear going mad like him losing his mind like those Mm -hmm. those ideas that are just universal with all human beings right jealousy rage love Mm-hmm. Um, deception, mm-hmm. which is, you know, much ado is about mm-hmm. deception and gossip as mm-hmm. well. But these ideas that exist now within all of us, just because we're humans, are the things that drew me to Shakespeare. And I think it's easier to, to have an all Black or all Asian production of a Shakespeare play mm-hmm. and have people be more accepting of seeing it. So th- mm-hmm. those are some of the things that drew me to Shakespeare. That's amazing. And, and I think um, I immediately comes to mind, there was this documentary on the director, John Barton, mm. and a kind of director of the, uh, and one of the co-founders, I believe, of the Royal Shakespeare Company. Yeah. And he was talking about just how some of his most memorable experiences on working on Shakespearean scenes were working with inner city schools and working with children of color, working with black children, working with children who are oppressed in, in many forms, because there was something about the language and Mm -hmm. something about the personal experiences of people who actually were experiencing deep traumas. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's something that also drew me to Shakespeare too, was the the experience of trauma, oppression, hate, love, all of these things being pulled to these extremes. Um, Mm -hmm. And as we've seen um, in the last few months in the last year about the extremity of violence against people of color, Black people, Asian people, um, to be specific about this last year by alone, um, that it takes an extreme kind of language to be able to try and capture that. And something about these plays, you know, even the sonnets, they, they, they really do that well. Um, and I think, and that leads me to my next question about this particular production, um, is an all Black cast and um, there were Black choreographers, um, things like that. So tell us about what the casting was like, what were the rehearsals like, performances, um, and what are your thoughts on the impact of this production um, in this contemporary context? So when I got to the audition for this play, I think I knew it was gonna be an all black black production. That really excited me, because I don't think that that happened uh, at Shakespeare in the Park since the 70s. I think it was like 1972. Mm-hmm. I may be mistaken exactly on the year, but it was um, the early 70s. Mm-hmm. I was actually in Los Angeles at the time. I was like working on a on a television show. I think I was working on Legion, maybe mm-hmm. at the last season of it. And, you know, the audition came through. So I had to do it 
um, initially on tape, which happens a lot now in this, you know, in the, in the digital age. Mm -hmm. So I had to do the tape and then I, you know, they had me come back and over, I don't know if it was Zoom at the time, I forget what it, what exactly it was, but some, we did, uh, uh, what was it? I forget what, anyway, it was some video chat medium mm -hmm. and I got a chance to talk to Kenny and then audition for him. Mm -hmm. Um, this was before the pandemic and you were already doing yeah, this was before the pandemic and it was like so it wasn't zoom i feel like zoom became really popular yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was actually what was it I, I i forget what it was now but anyway it was before the pandemic um and yeah so i had to you know i was in a, a living room and i just you know they were there the, the way me and you were talking it would be if i stood up and you know i had a reader with me one of my classmates was actually um my reader, my classmates from Julia talking about how, you know, the connection between being in school and being out in the professional world, mm -hmm. she read with me. Um, and, you know, it was lucky enough that, that I was cast in the production. Mm -hmm. And then the rehearsals were pretty, it was, it, was a, it was a great rehearsal process. It felt really collaborative, which is always great when an actor can feel like they're actually a part of building the entire, the world of, what's going on in a play because sometimes you may get a director who's like stand here do this do that do that and it, you know kind of limits your creativity and it limits how much you you feel like you can bring yourself or your own ideas to a production so thankfully with this production that wasn't the case we got to talk a lot about what it means that we're all black that this is an all black production that it takes place and takes place in Atlanta and one of the big things that was really I think significant was that in the beginning of the play, all the soldiers um, are coming back from a war. But in our production, we were coming back from a protest. Um, mm -hmm. And it was really, and I think that was a really um, important thing just for where we are in the world right now and where, where we always are, <laughs> honestly. Mm -hmm. in America. But you know, with, with more things being recorded and with social media, people's uh, access to information and videos, you know, these things are bubbling to the surface more consistently, even if they have always existed. So it was important for us to come back, be coming back from a protest um, for racial uh, justice. Mm -hmm. so we come back from that. And then at the end of the play, you know, we have this this play, which is about deception and about lovers, which we'll talk about you know, more as we go along. But at the end of the play, I think something that's really interesting, we can dig into it deeper later, is that we end up having to go back. Mm. I think a big thing that we wanted to highlight is that this process, the struggle, the protests, the using your voice, um, I just saw, I don't know if it was you who had it, but someone on the email said, your silence won't save you. Is that Audrey Lord? Is that your quote? Is that or is that Not my quote? But that's a great one. Yeah. So yeah. someone I saw had it at the bottom of their email, I think, right? Mm -hmm. So just this idea, I think, was always in the permanent permeating in the in the subtext of the production, even with us starting the play with the Marvin Gaye song, What's Going On? Mm -hmm. That idea of the times and what's happening and right before the election, um, mm -hmm. the 2020 election, all those things were playing, but we wanted them to be there, but still tell this story as clearly as possible. Right, right. Well, we're about to go into seeing our first scene. Okay. Um, tell us a little bit about this first scene that we're about to see. Um, and its significance um, where we have uh, the, the story being woven here. Okay. Mm -hmm. so I believe this scene is going to be Don John, who's, it's me, Don John, and Don Pedro, mm -hmm. actually at the end of, uh, that's where the, the meat of the scene is. Um, and Don John is telling me that the woman that I'm going to marry, that I'm supposed to marry the following day, Hero, has been cheating on me the entire time we've been together. Oh, goodness. All right, well, let's, let's get that clip going, please. Oh, 
<laughs> for my life to break with him about Beatrice. Tis even so, Hero and Margaret have by this played their parts with Beatrice, and then the two bears will not bite one another when they meet. <laughs> my lord and brother, God save you. Good evening, brother. If your leisure served, I would speak with you. In private? If it please you. Yet Count Claudio may hear, for what I would speak of concerns him. What's the matter? Means your lordship to be married tomorrow. You know he does. I know not that when he knows what I know. If there be any impediment, I pray you discover it. You may think I love you not. Let that appear hereafter. And aim better at me by that I now will manifest. For my brother, I think he holds you well, and in dearness of heart hath hope to affect your ensuing marriage, surely suit till spent and labor will bestowed. What's the matter? I came hither to tell you the lady is disloyal. Who? Hero? Even she. Leonardo's hero. Your hero. Every man's hero. Disloyal. The word is too good to paint out her wickedness. I could say she were worse. Think you of a worse title and I will fit her to it. Wonder not till further warrant. Go but with me tonight. You shall see her chamber window entered even the night before her wedding day. If you love her then, tomorrow wed her. But it would better fit your honor to change your mind. May this be so. I will not think it. If you dare not trust that you see, confess not that you know. If you will follow me, I will show you enough. And when you have seen more and heard more, proceed accordingly. If I see anything tonight why I should not marry her, tomorrow in the congregation where I should wed, there will I shame her. And as I wooed for thee to obtain her, I will join with thee to disgrace her. I will disparage her no farther till you are my witnesses. Bear it coldly, but till midnight, and let the issue show itself. Oh, day untoward return. Oh, mischief strangely thwarting. Oh, plague right well prevented. So will you say when you have seen the sequel. <laughs> Don uh, Don John is the main villain of the of the play, and this particular scene, in a lot of ways, sets the plot in motion. Mm -hmm. So I'm after when we come back from the protest in our particular production, we've been gone for a while. I come back and I see Hero who's a very powerful man's daughter. And I had my eye on her before I left and I see her again and I'm like, I'm just head over heels in love with her. Mm -hmm. We end up, you know, getting together, realizing that we feel this way. Mm -hmm. Boom, we're gonna marry each other and mm -hmm. everything is, you know, this is a, this is a huge deal. Mm -hmm. and so he comes in and he says everything he said in that scene, which is essentially, the woman that you love has been sleeping with everybody. That's why he says everyone's hero. Mm -hmm. And in these times, even though this was, we moved it to 2019, when he, when Shakespeare wrote it, someone saying that, that your fiance had slept with anyone, even yeah. one man would be a yeah. huge thing because chastity was so important in their time. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that's so interesting and unfortunate about this scene is that he immediately goes to shaming, publicly shaming a woman, mm -hmm. which we see constantly now is a, a huge issue that women deal with. Mm -hmm. So my character who in a lot of ways, you know, it's a tough character to play because he does a lot of unforgivable things. Yeah. Um, so instead of talking to her, instead of having a conversation mm -hmm. in private or uh, knowing that she would never do that, or just, just you know, some communication, he decides that at their wedding tomorrow, in mm -hmm. front of everybody, mm -hmm. he's gonna bring this up. Yeah. And he already has his mind set because he sees Don John sets up another scheme in place where he makes it seem like she's talking to someone out his window. Mm. And he goes forth with publicly shaming her mm -hmm. and actually physically assaulting her well, let's, her at a wedding. <laughs> let, let's 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 check this. We have that scene on on deck, so let's get that one going so we can see how all of this plays out. 
You come hither, my lord, to marry this lady? No. To be married to her? Friar, you come to marry her? <laughs> lady, you come hither to be married to this count? I do. If either of you know any inward impediment why you should not be conjoined, I charge you on your souls to utter it. Know you any hero? None, my lord. Know you any count? I dare make his answer none. <laughs> oh, what men dare do, what men may do, what men daily do, not knowing what they do. How now, in ejection? Stand thee by, friar. Father, by your leave, will you with free and unconstrained soul give me this maid, your daughter? As freely, son, as God did give her me. And what have I to give you back, whose worth may counterpoise this rich and precious gift? Nothing. Unless you render her again. Sweet prince, you learn me noble thankfulness. There, Leonardo! Take her back again! Give not this one in orange to your friend. She's but the sign and semblance of her honor. Behold, how like a maid she flushes here. Oh, what authority and show of truth can cunning sin cover itself with all? Comes not this blood as modest evidence to witness simple virtue? Would you not swear, all you that see her, that she were made by these exterior shows? But she is none. She knows the heat of a luxurious bed. Her blush is guiltiness, not modesty. What do you mean, my lord? Not to be married. Not to knit my soul to an approved wanton. Dear my lord, if you and your own proof have vanquished the resistance of her youth and made defeat of her virginity... I know what I... you would say. If I have known her, you will say she did embrace me as a husband and so extenuate the forehand sin. No, Leonardo. I never tempted her with word too large, but as a brother to his sister, showed bashful sincerity and comely love. And seemed I ever otherwise to you. Out on these seeming, I will write against it. You seem to me as dying in her orb, as chaste as is the bud ere it be blown. But you are more intemperate in your blood than Venus or those pampered animals that rage in savage sensuality. Is my lord well that he doth speak? So wide! Sweet prince, why speak not you? What should I speak? I stand dishonored that I've gone about to link my dear friend to a common stale. Are these things Sir. spoken or do I but dream? Sir, they are spoken and these things are true. This looks not like enough. True? Oh, God. Leonardo, stand I here. Is this the prince? Is this the prince's brother? Is this face heroes or our eyes our own? Oh, this is so. But what of this, my lord? Let me but move one question to your daughter, and by that fatherly and kindly power that you have in her, bid her answer truly. I charge thee to do so, as thou art my oh child. God, defend me! How am I beset? What kind of catechizing call you this? To make you answer truly to your name. Is it not hero? Who can blot that name with any just reproach? Marry that can hero. Hero itself can blot out hero's virtue. What man was he talked with you yesternight out at your window betwixt twelve and one? Now if you are a maiden, answer this. I talked with no man at that hour, my lord. Why then are you no maiden? Leonardo! I am sorry you must hear. Upon mine honor, myself, my brother, and this grieved count did see her, hear her, at that hour last night, talk with a ruffian in her chamber window, who hath indeed, most like a liberal villain, confessed the vile encounters they have had a thousand times in secret. Fie! Fie! They are not to be named, my lord, not to be spoke of. There is not chastity enough in language without offense to utter them. Thus... Pretty lady, I am sorry for thy much misgovernment. Oh, hero. What a hero hadst thou been if half thy outward graces had been placed about thy thoughts and counsels of thy heart. But fare thee well, most foul, most fair. Farewell, thou pure impiety and impious purity. For thee, I'll lock up all the gates of love, and on my eyelids shall conjecture hang, to turn all beauty into thoughts of harm, and never shall it more be gracious. Has no man's dagger here a point for me? Oh, well, how now, cousin? Wherefore sink you down? Come, let us go. So 
unfortunate that all of these things uh, actually tie so closely into discussions that we're having about misogyny and toxic masculinity these days. I, I mean, what is it like for you to play this character who gets so much wrong? <laughs> like, what is it? How, how did you prepare for these scenes? And, and what do you think is its resonances? I think when you play all characters, you can't judge them. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember I saw like a Maya Angelou interview and she said, you know, I'm paraphrasing phrasing to, mm -hmm. to some extent, but it's like anything that you see another human do, you have to know that you have within you because you are also human, mm -hmm. the capability to do that as well, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Because we're all humans, we have within us depending on what traumas we experienced in our youth, in our lives growing up, where we were taught, the things that we were not taught. You as a human have all of these things inside of you, the evil, the jealousy, the rage, all of those things. Mm -hmm. You know, we learn and we're taught um, to treat people with humanity and kindness and generosity, ideally, hopefully we're taught these things. Mm -hmm. But if you're taught something else, or if you grow up in a, another environment, you may have had the ability to do that as well. Mm -hmm. So when you're, an, when, a, when you're an actor and you're playing a character who's doing things that are different than you would ever do, you have to, start to set up a backstory or a history for yourself mm -hmm. so you can put your mind in a place that would get you to do the things that your character would do mm -hmm. or that your character is doing. Mm -hmm. I think in, uh, the way that I approached it is that I wanted to show that he actually loved her mm -hmm. in his own twisted way in his own unhealthy way that people shouldn't love each other mm -hmm. he loved her and i wanted to try to show as as wrong as what he was doing i think the thing for me was to try to make him a complete human being who was making a series of mistakes mm -hmm. because his because he was so enraged but i think we see through this that we obviously know that these things aren't <laughs> reactions of love but they're they're toxic mm -hmm. so these are these are actions of jealousy and rage and um performative things to boost your ego or your masculinity that we unfortunately see people participate in men participate in so yeah. often now mm -hmm. so something like this particular scene was a really big discussion and rehearsal a lot. And it took a long time to figure out how much, how violent should it be? There were moments in time when the throwdown was much more violent, but we were like, no, it can't be that because the dad, the father or someone or the yeah. cousin would have, yeah. you know, tried to attack him. And there were, uh, uh, you know, we went through it at moments in time and I was attacked in rehearsal. And, you know, we just tried it a bunch of different ways to figure out what level but we knew we wanted some violence there to tell that story to tell to, to make this a topic of conversation that men constantly now um partner violence is huge it's it, it's a large epidemic yeah. and it's something that can't be ignored and a lot of the times it's it's ego it's this false idea of what it means to be a man or what masculinity means. Mm -hmm. And Claudio is someone who got caught up in all that. He got caught up in his ego. He got caught up in performing in front of everyone and showing everyone that no one could ever, no woman could ever treat him that, that way. And you have all these co-conspirators with him, um, mainly Don John, but even Don Pedro. Cause there's a moment there in that scene where I'm, where he's like kind of, about like he's looking at it, he gets closer and he's like, I forget exactly what um, Claudio says, but he 
he's something, you know, he, he's starting to see the beauty in her. And yeah. he's starting to believe that she could never do something like this. This person who I've known so deeply and so intimately could never do this. And then Don Pedro, like kind of snaps him out of it with a word. And he's like, yes, back to like what I came here to do. Mm-hmm. I came here to embarrass this woman, mm-hmm. to humiliate her. Mm-hmm. And we see these things happen, whether it's men who get turned down by on the street, right. talking to women. And we see that, we see like literal violence happen to women in so many different circumstances at the hands of men. So that this, this was a really, you know, it was a, it was a difficult thing to discuss and to think about and talk about um, in the play, but we thought it was important to just highlight, you know, to, to have these discussions and hopefully people will realize how common this is. And so hopefully men will realize like how foolish their actions are. Yeah, and, so- and it's it's so, it's so important, um, all of this linking back up to what you were saying too, um, that uh, this, this is a great link to reveal just how important the arts are, how important theater is. It, this this quote that you were talking about with Maya Angelou, um, these are things that we all experience. Um, these are things that we all feel, even if we don't enact them. Um, these are things that we can identify with. And so to somehow identify with someone that is outside of your body kind of is, is helpful. Um, and so with that being said, we've got one final clip um, and then we'll go right into questions, uh, Q&A uh, about reconciliation, about forgiveness. Um, and yeah, we can probably go ahead and get that going and, and see how this, this knot is untangled. Which is the lady I must seize upon. This saying is she, and I do give you her. Why, then she's mine. Sweet, let me see your face. No! (laughs) That you shall not do. You take her hand before this friar and swear to marry her. (laughs) Give me your hand before this holy friar. I am your husband, if you like of me. And when I lived, I was your other wife. And when you loved, you were my other husband. Another hero. (laughs) Nothing certainer. One hero died defiled, but I do live. (laughs) And surely as I live, I am a maiden. The former hero, hero that is dead. She died, my lord, but whilst her slander lived. All this amazement can I qualify when after that the holy rites are ended, I'll tell you largely a fair hero's death. Meantime, let wonder seem familiar and to the chapel let us presently. Oh, soft and fair, friar. Which is Beatrice? want to say one quick thing i know we we're running out of time i go for it yeah but her slapping me back is not you know shakespeare didn't write that in the play Mm -hmm. that was a big point of discussion in the rehearsal whether there should be some because there has to be a reconciliation Mm -hmm. maybe in our real lives there would never be a reconciliation that's not something that maybe someone would choose to forgive or someone would choose to marry someone who shamed them publicly in that way but there had to be a reconciliation between Hero and Claudio and the idea of her slapping him was in some ways for her to take her power and her agency back. People, some, some people within the rehearsal felt like that wasn't a good idea. And some felt it like it was, but we ultimately ended up going with that. But it was a, a thing that was, you know, like an entire hours, <laughs> hours in a rehearsal process it took some time to, to, just, to come to that conclusion that that was what we wanted. I love it. I think it really worked. It was just great. It was great to see those three scenes 
and kind of that plot condensed for us tonight with both of you discussing it. That was really, really brought me back <laughs> when I first saw the show uh, that Thanksgiving of 2019. And it's, it's really kind of helped shape my, my understanding of Much Ado. So thanks so much for that. Um, we have a couple of questions here from the audience. Um, Adiz asks, uh, can you talk, Jeremy, about the differences in your approach to acting on stage versus film? Hmm. Hmm. It's an interesting question. I mean, I think that one of the major differences between film and television is, and theater is that in film and television, things aren't in chronological order because you have to do what makes the most financial sense to get this thing done. So you may shoot the end of a TV show or film on the first day or second day of filming. And you have to be able to get to that moment without having gone through all these emotions and having an entire story behind you like you do when you're doing a play. You get to live through it, go through it. Even if you're backstage, you get to stay in it just and you've experienced it, you lived it, your energies with it. Whereas with film and television, it's really scene by scene and it could be in any order. So I think there's sim the similarities are that I try to always create a backstory and I try to you know, make him make these characters feel as real as possible. Um, where did they grow up? What are some of their histories, their traumas? What have they experienced? to make them into this person that they are now. And I think the, the, biggest difference, the biggest difference is that it's not in chronological order and that, you know, always in the theater, a thing is like hit the back wall, hit the back wall. There's a level of energy and vocal energy and physical energy that you're putting into a, film, uh, a, a performance in the theater that is dialed down a little bit in film and television. Great, thank you, Jeremy. Um, here's a question from Ann G. She says, great conversation. If you wanted to produce, direct a Shakespeare play to get across an anti-racist message, which one would you choose? And what are some elements you'd include in the production? I think, you know, hearing from both of you guys would be great on that. <laughs> Since I know Jabril's thought a lot about Shakespeare too, but yeah, what Jabril, would you? Uh, <laughs> probably is a, is a Shakespeare scholar more than me. I mean, the play, I was thinking about this play a lot for some reason, but um, The Merchant of Venice really sticks out to me for some reason with what Shylock goes through and some of the prejudice he experiences being Jewish. But I always thought like, what would that be like with characters of color? Like them having to deal with that level of you know, discrimination throughout the play. And then at one moment in time, having the ability to get some right for revenge mm -hmm. and what that, you know, what that would look like with characters of color saying like, no, I want, a pound, I want my pound of flesh mm -hmm. because that's what was promised to me. Mm -hmm. you, it's the point you, if it was me, I would have no other option because I'm Jewish. There would be no other option. You would take your pound of flesh from me and that would be it. You always discriminate against me. You look down on me. So I think that would be a really interesting production um, with characters of color. Then that can get, a, that, you know, you could do a lot with getting across um, some, some anti-racist um, conversation or messaging. Jabril, yeah. any thoughts about that? That's just so hard. It's really so hard. Um, but uh, I guess since I, I just wrote a few papers on it, um, <laughs> I'm kind of also thinking um, Anthony Cleopatra um, to, but to amp, but to displace it from Egypt and Rome, um, because I find it interesting that there are so many. Um, because because England was doing so much copying of Rome and its colonizing missions and its expansion missions, um, and I I believe that Shakespeare was critiquing that with the play Anthony and Cleopatra, and so I think that if we were to take it out of that and put it into a colonized America situation like of indigenous people being Cleopatra and then maybe 
uh, England, it's Rome, um, you know, or, and Antony and, and Caesar, and that suddenly it, it brings a, a new light to those expansion missions, those loves, who is on one side, who is the other, how do these different cultures actually, how are they the same, how are they different, and what do they value? Um, I think there might be a really interesting reading to be done there. Wow, you're giving us some great ideas. Um, our, our patron, Kirk Davis, um, says this was a great production of Much Ado About Nothing. Is there any chance of a reunion to do Hamlet? <laughs> and maybe the, another way to put that is just, what are your thoughts about Hamlet? Have you seen the, the Royal Shakespeare Company with Papa Estadu set in, in this African country? I have not. Mainly, mainly black African cast, very powerful. We watched it in my grad seminar. I have, to watch, I have to watch that. I have not seen that. It's um, good. I saw it live in Stratford, and then I got the DVD and was able to share it with my students. And wow. uh, so maybe we'll do a little thing on that some other time. <laughs> yeah, I have to see if I, I, I can find it. I don't, I don't, I have no clue if there's a possibility for a reunion of us doing Hamlet. But, you know, I, I think it's something to think about. Obviously, with everything, it's always scheduling. And hopefully, we'll get back to having the theater be available soon um, in a bunch of different capacities. So that is a, that is a great idea. But I, I honestly don't know <laughs> the chances of it happening. OK, well, I want to thank you guys. I want to thank Kirk Davis, not only for his question, but for sponsoring this annual lecture for the public. I want to thank my students who I can see showed up at my request. Thank you, students. I want to thank our great audience and especially Jeremy and Jabril. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Everybody have a great evening.